obviously, I have to admit that I was wrong, but uh, this is super exciting. Um, if we can pull this off, it's a complete game changer. I'm sure you guys will agree. So we're making fantastic progress. Uh, we're very much on track. That is now four, I believe, from, from six. So now we're coming on to the one that I think everybody would have expected to see on the agenda. And every company brochure, every website you look at now, companies saying they're AI companies, they're machine learning companies. It's something that everybody's claiming, everybody's talking about. But working on the business side of the company, I like to be slightly skeptical of those things. And so you know, I'm going to hand it over to Brian and say, well, you know, what does it really mean when companies say they, they have AI machine learning? What does that really mean? I don't know. But <laughs> let me ask a simple question, which is, you know, you drive some kind of car type vehicle. Sure, yeah. Uh, so what would it take for you to agree that every time you're on a highway, that you will take your foot completely off the gas and brake and let the car deal with staying in the lane and following the car in front of you? Yeah, that would, uh, that would take a lot. With your kids in the backseat? Yeah, that, I wouldn't do it. So what if I told you that we could save 30% of your gas mileage, and more importantly, that the car is twice as good at braking in the case of an accident, that you will actually have a much higher chance of saving your family's life if you're willing to let the car take care of highway speed braking? Yeah, I, I would like to save their life, and petrol money. Yes. Oh, so, petrol. Excuse so, me. Yes. So, but this is the thing. Like, this isn't just an advertising question. You know, unfortunately, we don't have lives at stake usually when we're trafficking campaigns. But this is the question that we're asking all of our clients. We're saying, what would it take not to let the car drive itself here, but just to let it do a little bit for you in ways that can dramatically save costs, but also potentially um, do things like pacing, which is a similar example, mm -hmm. or um, basic optimization where I think that the machine learning technology might actually be better than humans. We still need human intuition. We need human creativity. And so for us at AppNexus, at least, mm. this has been where we've been researching, is what's the place where we can actually augment people and traders and ad ops folks with machine learning technology to help them do their jobs better? Um, we call this augmented line items. It's something we've worked on since 2011. Um, we've had a data science team working on this. We're really excited. We've had it in client hands since last April, and we're seeing very good results. And so I'm really excited to announce that this is going into closed beta next week. And this is technology that you can try and play with. It's certainly not done. There's a lot more to do. But what we're trying to do is demonstrate that by letting the machine do a few simple tasks for you, you can get much better results. And I think this is the beginning of a transition for the whole industry toward mm -hmm. you know, figuring out what humans are really, really good at and taking some of the other aspects of there's trafficking be, and managing. There's got to be like a trust issue associated there. I mean, obviously, if you were doing these things yourself previously, how can you, you need to be able to trust that. You're handing the keys over, if you like, to, to the computer. Well, let, let's bring some experts out here who do this for a living, and let's see if we trust what they have to say and uh, really understand what it's going to take to make AI and machine learning a reality for us in this industry. OK, perfect. So leading the next session, as you'll see in the, in the program, is our chief data scientist, Catherine Williams. Well, hello, everyone. With that introduction, I'm sure you're all excited to hear about machine learning and AI. So let me start with an interesting statistic recent, from recent analysis from the IDC. It said that widespread adoption of artificial intelligence and machine learning will drive an estimated $47 billion of revenue in the year 2020, which is up from around $8 billion in 2016. That's a nearly 500% increase, 55% year over year which is enormous. That's stunning, right? So just to remind you what we're talking about, machine learning is a type of artificial intelligence that provides computers with the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And it focuses on the development of computer programs that can change when exposed to new data, so the intelligence portion. It's similar to that of data mining, but more advanced. So here with me today to discuss the hype and the reality of data science, uh, my distinguished panel of experts, let me introduce them. Carl Bunch, SVP of Global Product at Zaxis, a global digital media platform. Jürgen Galler, the co-founder and CEO of OnePlusX, which is an AI-powered DMP. And Remy Lemonnier, uh, co-founder of Cybids, a next-generation bidding engine. Welcome, and thank you for joining us. 
Okay, so just to baseline, what are we talking about here? I'd love for Carl, for you to tell us just briefly, how do you use machine learning in your business today? Well, about two years ago, we started an initiative called Copilot, which was a trader-specific optimization tool that focused on using machine learning. We've grown that to 250 users now in 44 countries, and by 2020, we expect 70% of all of our revenue its access to be powered by ML. That's a pretty huge initiative. Remy, could you tell us briefly how you use ML? Well, at Cybit, machine learning is uh, our core business value. Since we are a third-party machine learning provider for both um, media trading desk and uh, agencies. Um, I like to say that our mission is to solve the fundamental problem of real-time bidding for a buying side perspective, which is to maximize the estimated value of the impression you buy minus the estimated price you will pay for this impression. And we do that by uh, building an AI-based bidding model on top of, of AppNexus that we deliver either in self-service or in managed services. So two buy-side use cases for machine learning, which I realize I abbreviated as ML without even thinking about it. If I say ML, it means machine learning. So what those of you in the audience may not realize is that uh, machine learning has a footprint in the sell side as well, and there are some pretty compelling use cases. So Jürgen, uh, I know your company, OnePlus X, works with some top publishers, including Axel Springer. Can you tell us a little bit about how your company uses machine learning? Absolutely. <clears throat> so we're actually kind of um, explaining that uh, based on the slides that you just see behind me. We use uh, machine learning to improve audience building, right? So we actually kind of help publishers, media resellers, actually also some advertisers to build audiences, high quality audiences. What you see here in this slide is the standard approach. A data management platform today is mainly used um, to actually bring together different data sources, also lists as we call it, um, so you have a campaign, you say you want to reach females interested in food because you want to actually sell this product. Um, you know, you want to target them through a specific ad server. So what do you do? You go out, you buy a listing maybe of um, female users that are active on the web, on mobile. Um, you actually look uh, who is interested in food, you get another listing, maybe you build some lists yourself, maybe others are from data providers. You bring that all together in a data management platform and that platform then actually kind of brings out, you know, the, 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 the final result, females interested in food um, uh, targetable through the set server. The problem that we see there is that um, the actual result is often very small, right? So many of you that have worked in this space, it's a, it's a typical problem. Um, you know, the data sources don't match. Um, the data quality is maybe poor. Um, it doesn't really, you, you, you don't, you cannot adjust reach. Um, so the, the final result is actually small, and that's why um, very complaints in industry are often like, hey, very specific audiences are often too small. Um, so we thought about this um, to actually kind of build um, a, a new approach, uh, an approach to uh, facilitate, um, bring more intelligence into data management and actually audience building. So, Catherine, if you could just click to yep. the next slide. So, we, what we did is like we basically built um, machine learning interpretation on top of all the data sources that a publisher uh, could give us. So, in the center, the web events, all the events that he sees users reading his articles, um, login data. Um, we crawl the articles, we extract signals from the articles. We, we, you, we, we collect all this data, we produce this data, and then in a machine learning language, we basically say we create an embedding space. And from that one, we create uh, profiles for every single user, and um, profiles um, including uh, gender, age, income, interest, and so on, that are highly flexible and where every attribute of every user has a confidence score of the predictive quality. So if I would say, if I would do a prediction for Remy, or I would do a prediction for Katrin, you know, gender, interest, everything would be there, and we would say like, oh, you know, the certainty that Katrin is female is so high, that she's in this age group is so high, and so on. So at the end, the company, the publisher, or media reseller that builds an audience can control how much quality and how much reach he actually wants to achieve. So 
this is, a, I think, a, a really impactful way to use machine learning in this space to come up with a much better interpretation of your users, of your audiences, and actually um, deliver something back to the market that has not been there. Right? So our customers, including Axel Springer, as you already mentioned, um, you know, are super happy that they finally um, get into a situation where they can um, exp profile and target a much wider space of their uh, user base. Um, Excellent. And, and machine learning really works there. We control the quality uh, through panels, yep. so we really look into it, and, and it really works. And I think you're beginning to touch on a theme we'll come back to, that combination of human intelligence and intuition with the machine learning, being able to have some sort of a control there. So that's a pretty compelling story. Let's return to the buy side, though, for a moment. And I just want to point out that machine learning, the hype machine for machine learning on the buy side is in full effect. It's part of just about every pitch I think you hear, um, including AppNexus. So uh, I have to ask those of you representing the buy side here today, is it all just hype? Or is it BS? Or I'm told that in Britain I can call it uh, bull SH1T. Oh. <laughs> so, Remy, will you share some results with us about some tangible uh, results from machine learning? OK, so um, let's uh, take a, an example. Of, for, for instance, a, a mainstream uh, optimization of a campaign. Uh, I've been optimizing campaign for five euros when I was in French uh, training desk. And I always started by uh, throwing a bunch of monovite analysis. So for instance, you would look at your top 10 sellers and compute the conversion rate and try to bid according, accordingly to the relative interest of each seller. But then I was asking, OK, but what about the hour parting? And if you want to do that perfectly, you have for each of your 10 sub-campaigns um, at 24 sub-campaigns. So you have 240 sub-campaigns just in order to explain to be perfect about two features of the 40 you receive for the AppNexus bid request. So a lot of setup for just a little bit of juice. Yes, and if, if you wanted to build the whole bunch of combinations, you will have millions of them. And of course, you can handle millions of sub-campaign or say anything statistically significant about such small such campaign. And so what the, the AI does uh, when you, I mean, our AI does uh, when we build um, a PB tree is that we automatic, automatically select the few hundred or few thousands of relevant configuration and find the, the exact amount to bid um, on each of these configurations. And so with this improved granularity and accuracy, uh, what we saw that actually it was, we were able to not bring only a slight improvement, but really a dramatic improvement of our cost per acquisition and really divide the CPA by a factor ranging from 2 to, to 10. So that's a huge improvement. But what about the human insights portion? Yes. Uh, next. Yeah. yeah. So, so, I mean, wh one um, criticism ab about uh, uh, AI-based bidding models is that people sometimes say that there are black boxes. And actually, what we found was the exact contrary, was that if we, if we let the algorithm bid and we perform um, a post-bid analysis, then we can learn a lot about what's happening uh, for our specific advertiser. So this is, for instance, a use case. Um, for home and garden advertiser. And on the left, you, ha you have a heat map of the bid. And what we saw is that we were bidding much higher on the northeast of France and much less on the Paris region. And we didn't really understand why, so we, we saw some analysis with government data. And what we discovered is that actually, um, so for home and garden advertiser, the algorithm was bidding almost inversely proportionally to the tenant density, which is equal to the population density. Um, and you can understand that uh, the less the region is dense, the more people tend to have a garden, and times the tenant proportion. And you can also understand that uh, when people do not own their, their, their home, they are less likely to do some work on it. And what was very interesting is that this tenant density was not at all a part of the variable the algorithm received, but it was able to approximate it by uh, using the region feature of the AppNexus program builder. So you took what the algorithm did and then backed out this fascinating insight that isn't actually what drove the algorithm, but nonetheless was a really meaningful human insight. So you're describing both tangible outcomes in terms of performance as well as the insight portion. All right, how about you, Carl? Do you have some tangible results for us, or is it all hype? Ah, well, everything Brian says is hype. We all know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, he's backstage getting ready to kill me. The, 
No, I, I'm a deep believer in this. As I said, a couple of years ago, we started investing in this deeply. And a couple of things come out of it that we've learned in the last couple of years. One of them is, the here's a campaign here that actually the Denmark team might be in the audience somewhere. Congrats and shout out. All right. <laughs> They submitted this to Icon and actually won. They built a model, shock surprise, by taking all the conversions from a site and then running it through a model and then outputting that model and building an APB tree. And you can see here it rapidly got to the very, very best CPA and it had a great opportunity to exploit and explore. The, the thing I love about this is this is both the human that understands there's some piece of information we can, we can use and we can feed that to the machine, and then the machine being able to execute that at massive scale. As Remy was saying earlier, this campaign, if we set it up by hand, would be 2,520 campaigns. Can you imagine typing that out all day long and then trying to manage it and report it? So it was a very good example of both successful intuition, but also the efficiencies you can drive through this kind of technology. Sure. And the next in the next slide, this is actually kind of an interesting slide also. It's a little technical. We almost didn't put it up here, but I've really fought to, to put it up. He did. The, the, top, the top cluster here is manual traders. That's just somebody going in, putting $1.50 in, and saying, I think this user or this campaign line item. The bottom cluster here is the machine learning algorithms. And the two things to take away from this is there's a 20% difference in precision between those two things. And you could imagine how, that important, how important that is to my advertisers and my boss. And the other thing that's very interesting is these are tens of thousands of campaigns being ran by the machine also. We ran into a problem. You could see a little couple little gaps in here. And we realized during those gaps there's a problem. A bunch of people got in the room. We analyzed it. We got data scientists and traders and people who really know how these campaigns work. They figured it out. They solved it in five days and fixed it and immediately all those campaigns were fixed. So now we have the scale of human intuition combined by what machines do well. They compute. What I say over and over, I've said it last year, and I say it over and over every time I get a chance to, to talk about it, we are developing systems that create more time to think. That's what these things are about. Yeah, so Carl, you're raising a pretty interesting point here. You have 250 traders worldwide, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and they're accustomed to doing things by hand and not necessarily working with yeah. machine learning. And so I think we're increasingly looking at needing to move to an era of, let's call them machine learning natives. If you think about what, what is a digital native, it's somebody who grows up using digital technology, knows what to expect from it, knows how to interact with it, what it can and can't do. I think 10, 20 years from now, we'll have a whole new generation of machine learning natives who know what machine learning AI can and can't do, how to interact with it, what parts to let it handle, how, when to give up your control for the machine, and which parts to make sure that you retain control and, and inject your insight. So coming back to your traders, how are you thinking about transforming your organization and your traders into being machine learning natives? Well, the most important thing to recognize is that marketing is a person-on-person -person situation. We are communicating one-to-one. -one. And these people who have been trading understand that deeply in their soul. They understand how to optimize campaigns. What's happening is they're getting overwhelmed. By 2020, I predict there will be 200 billion biddable events that my team is going to have access to. You can't do that with Excel. But you can't throw out these people who understand that. So what we're trying to do is develop systems that touch and tap into that heuristic knowledge and train them slowly to understand a different way of thinking. Additionally, this year, one of my goals is to have a, pro a program where we're going to teach each one of our traders machine learning from scratch so that they start thinking about how to solve problems. My engine engineering team is also going to be going through these things. Think about how to solve these things this way from scratch. Awesome. Remy, I think I've heard you speak a little bit about that same, needing that same balance between intuition and skills. Can you tell us, for you, I think machine learning natives will come via hiring since you're a smaller company. Tell us a little bit about that, your hiring philosophy. Yes, of course. So we have a very particular perspective about this question since, since we are, we are a, a startup. So we need to automate almost everything and also hire very polyvalent uh, people. But what we found out is that actually, even for the most uh, mathematical uh, jobs, like the data scientists that are looking at the algorithm, they cannot just understand why the algorithm fails for some specific campaigns of application downloads, for instance, if they don't know very precisely the market. And on the other hand, 
for the people who, who are doing uh, account management. Uh, they just cannot answer a question like, w why am I, am I spending less on this specific seller if they don't know exactly uh, what's going on inside the algorithm? Yeah, so, so, so we are really focusing on, uh, on um, hiring people that are, at the same time, machine learning savvy and programmatic savvy. Yeah, so in both cases, looking at transforming your own, uh, your own organization to have this hybrid approach. So Jürgen, I think uh, you have an interesting perspective because I've heard you speak not just about transforming your own team to have this hybrid approach, but also how you can help other companies who want to dip their toe into the machine learning waters to understand its benefits and how you then partner with them. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, absolutely. So, I mean, like um, many of our um, customers initially were like, hmm, you know, um, is this machine learning really working? Uh, are these predictions really kind of producing the quality and so on? And what we basically, many of them already have maybe a data management platform. So, what we then say is like, okay, you know, we can work in parallel. We can uh, not be, let's say, the data in, data out engine for you, but we can create data for you. We can create intelligent, actually, profiles. And then you can put these profiles into your normal existing uh, data management infrastructure. Um, we can help you with that. And that's like a really good approach because then they are like, we have our deterministic data that we have been using for very long. We buy data from here and there. And then we have this new you know, predictive stuff, this new machine learned uh, data that, and we can compare and we can actually kind of test it on campaigns and so on. So mm -hmm. I think like that is a really healthy approach for us. And I right. think also a good approach for companies to really, as you say, like tip their toes into right. machine learning. Yeah. So multiple paths then for beginning to head down that path towards becoming yeah. machine learning natives and understanding how to use the technology and take advantage of its opportunities. Well, if you, in the audience are interested in hearing more about the app Nexus journey towards using machine learning, building and deploying and taking advantage of it, then please uh, come to the breakout session this afternoon um, and bring your questions. Thank you so much to my Thank fellow you. panelists. Thank you.